Good afternoon. Welcome. We're so glad you're spending your lunch hour with us here at this webinar hosted by the Minnesota Water Research Fund. My name is Shannon Walker Surfer, and I work on the advancement team here in the College of Science and Engineering. And I'm so fortunate to be able to work with our college's alumni, our industry partners, our benefactors, and of course, the advisory committee for the Minnesota Water Research Fund. So as we get started today, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping things just to keep us on track with our webinar. First of all, if you'd prefer to listen to today's webinar by phone, feel free to just dial in using the option you can see on your screen right now. Uh, we also want you to know that you are welcome to submit questions for our presenters today. We'd like you to do that using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today following the presentation. If you run into any technical issues, we invite you to use the chat feature to submit those. My wonderful colleagues, Katie and Megan, are working hard behind the scenes, and they'd be happy to assist you if you run into some technical challenges. We want you to know that today's webinar is being recorded, and of course, we will share the link to the recording with you after the presentation, and of course, we encourage you to share it with anyone in your network. Finally, we are um, able to see captions today. So if you'd like to be able to show the captions and have that live auto transcript feature enabled, just go ahead and do that using the button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, housekeeping is over. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the chair and founder of the Minnesota Water Research Fund, Bernie Bullard. He is a visionary philanthropist who created Minnesota Water Research Fund in 2015. And we are so proud to call Bernie a University of Minnesota alumnus. He has both his civil engineering degree and his master in business administration degree from our university. And Bernie has devoted more than 50 years of his life to making sure that our water is safe. He is a well-known leader in the regional and national water and wastewater engineering field. Bernie has led St. Paul Regional Water Services. He's been director of water treatment and distribution for the city of Minneapolis and he shared his talents with several local firms such as SL Circo, CDM Smith, and TKDA. Not only that, he's been active in numerous professional associations, including AWWA and APWA. Bernie's incredible expertise and years of experience are matched only by his extraordinary passion to find research-based solutions to our most pressing water issues. This is why he established Minnesota Water Research Fund. I'm gonna turn things over now to Bernie to tell you more about what inspired him. Thanks so much for all you do, Bernie. I think I got it set. It's wonderful to have so many people joining us today. Welcome to our sixth research seminar webinar. I have spent my life and career as an engineer focused on water. That's why I created the Minnesota Water Research Fund at my alma mater. I, I see this as a legacy. Water research has an essential role to play in the future of our cities, states, and our nation. We cannot allow our knowledge, technologies, or water management practice, practices to become outdated. Research is vital to ensuring access to clean water for the 21st century. The philanthropically funded Minnesota Water Research Fund supports faculty and student water research in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering here in CSE. Our vision is to, is to enable the university to become a nationwide leader in innovative water research to improve public health, protect Minnesota water resources. Our environmental graduate program is currently ranked ninth by the US News and World Report. Research, communication, and fundraising are all vital components of our fund's work. With the help of our fund's advisory committee, we are driving toward our short and long-term goals. Our short-term goal is to annually fund, annually fund innovative water research by the U of M faculty and students to improve water treatment technology and water quality in our environment and invest in our, our students' success. The students of today will solve the problems of tomorrow. And many of the people listening today 
<clears throat> work for firms which will help implement those solutions for our citizens of tomorrow. Minnesota Water Research Fund's long-term goal is to get to the $2 million level to create an endowed chair to support a Minnesota faculty member who is an international leader in the field. From a research and education perspective, we're already making an impact. In just eight years, the Minnesota Water Research Fund has supported 10 research projects led by CSE engineering faculty working with graduate and undergraduate students. In addition, our fund has invested in pur purchases of water research equipment that will enhance research and teaching in CSE. We also regularly host research seminars like this one to introduce a broader audience of alumni, water industry leaders, and external stakeholders to the water research happening here at the university. For more information on our research fund, please visit our website. Reaching our goals would not be possible without the hardworking members of our volunteer advisory committee, which is composed of university alumni and water industries leaders, whose names are now on your screen. I'd like to thank the whole committee for their service in helping grow this water research fund. Fundraising and bringing new partners to our work helps drive our success. I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners who generously supported the fund in 2023 and those who are already committed to being partners for 2024. We had 11 partners in 23 this year and we already have 18 signed up as partners for 2024. And we certainly would welcome anybody to join that list and grow it some more. We are so grateful to these fellow generous visionaries, both individuals and local companies and organizations who are joining us to make our dream of long-term ongoing water research a reality for Minnesota. If you or your organization would like to become a 2024 partner, I'll provide more information at the, on this toward the end of today's webinar. <clears throat> I'll turn things back over to Shannon, who will introduce our featured presenters today. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bernie. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce our first expert presenter of the day, Dr. John Gulliver, who is likely a familiar face to many of you. John S. Gulliver is a professor emeritus in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering and a resident fellow of the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment. He received a BS in chemical engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and his master's and PhD degrees in civil engineering from the University of Minnesota. During his more than 40 years as a faculty member in our department, Dr. Gulliver has taught courses in fluid mechanics, environmental mass transport, and urban hydrology and water quality. Much of Dr. Gulliver's research, done in collaboration with other faculty, involves developing new technologies for the treatment of road runoff and the assessment of field performance of stormwater treatment practices. Just three examples include the SAFL baffle, which converts any sump into an effective sediment settling device. The iron enhanced sand filter, which removes dissolved as well as particulate phosphorus. And finally, the MPD infiltrometer, which can measure infiltration into soil accurately and effectively with minimal volume of water. Dr. Gulliver is also co-author of the book, Optimizing Stormwater Treatment Practices, a Handbook of Assessment and Maintenance, published by Springer. Please help me welcome Dr. John Gulliver. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, yes, I am John Gulliver, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering. I serve as a co-advisor with Andy Erickson of Noah Gallagher, who you will hear from shortly. But first, I need to get on my soapbox. Sorry about this, but you know, climate change adaptation is a topic that we are hearing more of, but it, we're just starting on it because our climate is changing as we speak. The projections are that in the northern Midwest and eastern portions of the United States, extreme storms are going to increase substantially. That means 34% in the northern Midwest, 73% in New England. When you talk about a 100-year storm, of let's say nine inches, 
and you add 73% onto that, that is substantial. Um, so we need to adapt the infrastructure to handle as best we can these larger, these extreme events. But infrastructure adaptation takes time. We really should have been working on this for the past 20 years. So we are getting to the research late in the climate change debate and hopefully we'll soon be informing practitioners about the most effective and most cost-effective way to adapt to these larger to these extreme storms. So is, it is with this in mind that I will introduce Noah Gallagher. Uh, Noah has worked with Andy and I since 2021, starting as an undergraduate researcher and moving on to a master's degree, and now as a PhD candidate. He has worked in field analysis, laboratory analysis, and now computational analysis. So he's well-rounded as an engineering scientist. He has worked on climate change adaptation with Andy Erickson, Bruce Wilson, Bill Herb, myself. And in, in this process, realized the need for a tool that he will be talking about today. The Minnesota Water Research Fund thus stepped in at an excellent time to help him research his goal of improved extreme event adaptation tool. So Noah has a short presentation that he has prepared and it is my pleasure to give you Noah Gallagher. Hello. As John mentioned, my name is Noah Gallagher. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering Department, as well as affiliated with St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. And today I will be discussing uh, an advanced storm or how we can advance stormwater models using uh, LIDAR enabled tools. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet, Noah. Uh, I believe whoever's sharing might need to stop sharing so that I can take over. How about now? Good to go. Awesome. So to begin, I'd like to acknowledge Bernie Bullitt, the Minnesota Water Research Fund Advisory Committee, and all of the donors to the fund. And express my sincere gratitude for the ability to pursue this avenue of research. Um, as a student, I didn't necessarily know whether I was going to continue my graduate studies, and funding like this is helpful in enabling the decision to pursue higher education be one that's made out of considerations that are not financial. So again, my sincere appreciation for all of those involved with the Minnesota Water Research Fund and providing funding for projects like this. So today, I'm going to be talking about why this project came to be in the first place, following it up with a brief uh, background on what light detecting and ranging technology is, why watershed modeling with EPA stormwater management model or SWIM is important, and briefly touching on extreme precipitation events before getting into sort of the benefits of a tool like this in implementing LIDAR within SWIM. So when discussing what prompted this project, it's a little bit of a long story, but the short version of it is that we wanted to visualize flood volume outputs as we were modeling storms that are expected to increase due to climate change and be able to tell what areas might be vulnerable. And we were getting outputs like this map on the right, which showed flood volumes or flood heights, but not necessarily what that flood water would look like if it was distributed on the landscape, i.e. what buildings would be impacted, whether there would be flooding in the street or it would be confined to a park. And when we tried to overcome that and spread these volumes out on the landscape, we came into some difficulties uh, with realistic flood maps. Steep slopes and large events meant that water was going everywhere and our flood mod mapping was um, perhaps not realistic. Um, at that point, we realized that there might be a need to integrate LIDAR and swim modeling in order to achieve good flood map visualizations and overall improve model accuracy. So what is LIDAR? Light detection and ranging technology is a type of remote sensing. 
There are multiple kinds, but today I'm going to be specifically talking about aerial LIDAR, which is LIDAR done out of an airplane. The airplane records four main data sets, all with the goal of determining at what height is the ground relative to a standard reference point. So all of the elevations in the state of Minnesota, like how high our highest point are, um, is something that LiDAR technology can measure. Um, in order to do this, it records the position of the plane through a highly accurate GPS. The orientation of the sensor um, by using onboard accelerometers and then it shoots out a laser pulse of light energy and records the time between that pulse going out and the return value uh, coming back in, as well as the intensity of how that return uh, is. From that, we can calculate the elevation of the ground surface because we know how far the ground was from the airplane and exactly where the airplane was. Uh, and this allows for large chunks of land to be measured at relatively high accuracy. Elevation uh, is interpreted from these categories of data, uh, which form a point cloud. And this resolution can be actually quite accurate. You get something like a one to three meter wide pixel um, that is able to measure the elevation within that pixel to a certainty of about 10 centimeters. So this can be extremely useful when determining the topography of a region. And in Minnesota, we are fortunate enough to have a good public availability for LiDAR data. There is current public access through MinTopo, uh, which was a project that completed between 2010 and 2012, and was able to survey much of the state to provide this sort of data for geospatial folks uh, to analyze but there is a current ongoing data acquisition process across the state um, with different parts of the state being recorded over different years as shown in the map on the right. And this new set of data collection is going to be even higher accuracy than the set that was measured in 2010 and through 2012 with about eight to 30 pulses per square meter rather than the approximate half a pulse per square meter uh, of the measurements uh, recorded in the previous decade. Now that we know a little bit about uh, LIDAR, we need to touch briefly on what urban watershed modeling is and why we do it. Like all models, urban watershed models are simplifications of reality, taking the hydrologically important aspects of a watershed and simplifying them into small packages that computers can understand, process, and then compute a bunch of equations to give us hopefully useful results. Those useful results tend to fall into two main categories, pollutant fate and transport, or what happens if there is a spill, how does it travel within the watershed, or does it get captured somewhere, and if there is such a spill, how can we respond? Additionally, it can produce uh, data products that are useful for predicting flood risks. If there is a really large storm, particularly in the face of climate change, as those storms get larger, what areas are vulnerable to flooding? Uh, and this is distinct from river flooding, uh, when a river rises and ends up causing damage to the surrounding community, but more similar to flash floods caused by periods of intense precipitation. The particular stormwater uh, model that I'm going to be discussing today is the EPA's stormwater management model, herein referred to as EPA SWIM. It is a free and open source modeling software that is being continually updated and has a robust community uh, that is able to discuss how to troubleshoot issues as modelers uh, become aware of them. And it is a hydraulic and hydrologic model. Um, it calculates the runoff produced from a rainfall event and then how that runoff transmits through the system and is able to look at how the system develops over time. It simplifies reality into discrete connected units uh, called nodes and then solves equations between those nodes, often from fluid dynamics, in order to determine how uh, the storm impacts the watershed itself. Finally, we need to touch briefly on extreme precipitation events. Uh, these are the really, really big events. 
Uh, one example is the 2012 storm in Duluth, which was extensively damaging, causing an estimated $100 million in damages from flooding. But these events are thankfully rare. Uh, a 100-year event only occurs in about one out of 100 years. Yet, unfortunately, we know that due to climate change, they seem to be increasing in frequency and severity. This is demonstrated through the Minnesota State Climatology Office at the Department of Natural Resources, which produced this plot. It indicates the number of events observed across Minnesota uh, for different return intervals, or one in 10 year storms, one in 100 year storms. And the 2010s had the most 10 and 100 year events out of any decade on record, um, which is indicating that this is a problem that is not getting better on its own. And we need to be considering these large events when developing resiliency for our urban watersheds. However, extreme precipitation can be very difficult to model. Uh, the main issues is that there's just a lot of water, which results in water where it normally isn't, and atypical flow paths where a modeler might not look at a particular area and think that it would be a significant contribution to how water flows, but once the water builds up in the system and there's a bunch of standing water everywhere, it's going to start going in new and novel places that are sometimes just really hard to estimate um, without having experienced a large flood in that area. And this is also a problem for calibration data. Oftentimes, there isn't a period on record when our modern sensors were out and recording data, and even if they were, extreme precipitation has a tendency to damage such sensors and make recording data to calibrate our models very difficult. So we end up in a situation where when we're modeling extreme precipitation, we have to extrapolate based on existing data. And this means that the input quality of our parameters, the way that we design the model, is particularly important to make sure it is as realistic as possible to get usable data out when we don't necessarily have high quality calibration data to put in. So now that we have all that background out of the way, how can LIDAR improve models? First and foremost, topography is crucial to how we model the transport of stormwater in a system. Water flows downhill. Um, and so knowing how the hills in the landscape are actually laid out can determine what water goes where within a watershed. Additionally, you can end up with puddles or large floodwaters that are detained in holes and depressions in the ground. And so identifying these as potential surface storage is also important for understanding the dynamics of a large storm in an urban area. This means that we should be able to better represent reality, improve those input parameters in our computer simulations when we take into account this LiDAR data um, in our SWIM modeling. So this brought up a large question. Um, we realized that doing this for hundreds and hundreds of nodes would be incredibly time consuming. So in order to improve our models, we realized that there would need to be some sort of tool that could reduce labor inputs for integrating this LiDAR data within our SWIM models and improve accuracy and ease of interpreting these SWIM model results. Here's one of the preliminary outcomes of this project where we were able to take LiDAR data to create this three-dimensional model of how water from one detention pond is able to flow down into the other and understand that it's not necessarily a circular pipe that can be uh, assumed in the model, but that it's a more dynamic system that has some complexities about how water gets from point A to point B, and that we need to be considering how much water can be detained at different areas. So now for a little bit more of a technical deep dive, uh, we're gonna be discussing storage nodes and storage curves. A storage node is that model representation of an area that can detain water. Uh, the computer is able to fill it up with a certain volume of water, depending on how much area is available for that storage device at a particular elevation. And that is described by a storage curve. 
which is represented in the figure on the right, where as you get higher in elevation, there's a larger cross-sectional area of your storage pond, surface detention, or even rainwater barrel. Um, and so these are different for different types of storage devices and are really important for how the computer calculates how much water can be in one location at one time. And we know that there are sometimes some labor saving shortcuts that oftentimes uh, can get taken when modeling, which would be to take engineering documentation of say a stormwater pond that describes very precisely um, how a stormwater pond develops from the bottom to the top in terms of cross-sectional area. And then beyond a certain point, there isn't available documentation. So one would either have to go out and measure directly or use some topographical maps in order to input uh, the elevation near a stormwater pond. So this can lead to assumptions being used about what that topography might look like beyond the as-built documentation. What LiDAR enables us to do is have a slightly more uh, accurate version of that topography um, with a high resolution, again, one to three meter in diameter pixels, uh, in order to better understand the actual area within a subcatchment that is available to store water. And finally, it allows us to take the sort of subcatchment area or these other discrete units within a model and put a cap on how much uh, water could have in a cross-sectional area because at some point it's spilling from one storage node into another. And this has some impacts on the model performance and outputs. For smaller events that we often have calibration data for, there is really not much of a change because it tends to stay within the pond or within the area that engineering documentation uh, is able to provide. But when you get to really, really big storms, you can have some discrepancies between how water would be stored on the actual ground service versus how it's represented in the computer. This is the equivalent volume of water uh, for two different storage curves that say that there's 10 feet of water in one and 14 feet of water in another. This difference in height is important for model outputs because it's that height of water that drives flow out of a lot of output devices. And so the ability to understand how much water pressure there is in an outlet structure determines how quickly that pond uh, has a, any outflow. This can also be important if there are secondary outlet structures at a higher elevation. If you say that there's an outlet structure at 12 feet, you're going to see in the example with 14 feet of water that that outlet structure is going to be in use and depositing water into whatever storage node it's connected to. Whereas in reality, water might not have reached that height in order to be using that conduit. In addition to storage nodes, there are also considerations about overland flow paths um, because not all flow happens in store or in stormwater pipes. In fact, most often the problematic flows are when we don't know where that water is or the water is going somewhere that it ought not be. Uh, this can involve streets and alleyways as well as backyards and natural low points in places like green spaces. Um, and floods move water differently than regular storms because once you've filled up the pipes and the well-known parameters, um, then you sort of get into this hazy idea of, well, how does water flow down a street or across a natural valley in a park? Um, and LiDAR can help us in identifying the low point between two storage nodes and the flow path that water would end up taking in reality and allow us to better represent that in our models. So if we were to consider two adjacent ponds, where does the water go when one overflows? Is it going to be happening more eastward or westward? Um, and how can we model that and represent that well on the computer? So in order to have a model representation, what LiDAR allows us to do is identify that lowest point and then determine what sort of flow paths would happen between those two ponds as one fills up. Uh, and begins to spill over into another. 
and then we can model that in the computer. Um, still a simplification, but one that better represents reality. Particularly, what LiDAR allows us to do is see the cross-sectional elevation of the sort of ridge that divides those two ponds. And this allows us to better estimate the flows between those ponds. Because if it is a very narrow necked ridge where there's only a few feet of width through which the water is going to be flowing, that's very different than if the water is going to be cresting over that ridge for the entire length of the pond. Um, and then the other aspect that this sort of LIDAR enabled technology uh, allows is for the length of flow, because the time it takes for it to flow over that hill can impact further elements in the model because the water might not arrive immediately at the second storage node. So having the ability to better characterize these overland flow paths again improves the model accuracy. And finally, we get to interpreting model outputs. This is the sort of tension that we were seeing when we were estimating our flood maps, that there was this discrepancy between flood depths and volumes, water sort of floating where you would expect it to flow into adjacent areas. And this can occur from missing or mischaracterized flow paths or those imperfect estimated storage curves. So when you take into account the exchange of water between different parts of the model, even if it's a abnormal flow site that might not occur to your typical modeler because, well, you don't expect water to be flooding through your backyard until it is, then you can end up with flood maps that better represent uh, these sort of reality and have this bi-directional exchange through overland flow paths and more accurate storage nodes. And because uh, the goal of the tool is to save labor on the time it takes to implement these things, it can reduce the amount of time that someone has to manually review what are the dimensions of a street or a park through which water might be flowing and sort of get a baseline from the model outputs. And when you consider the watershed as a web of connected storage node with well-defined curves and well-defined flow paths, it results in easier visualization of the model, where the depth of water and the volume of water match what might actually occur in the landscape during a flood. So, in summary, uh, extreme weather events are increasing and have their own set of unique modeling challenges. LiDAR data can improve certain aspects of modeling, particularly storage curves and overland flow delineation, and those sort of rare flow paths that might not be considered uh, when developing a model due to time or budgetary constraints. And finally, the topographic modeling basis or incorporating hills and valleys from the get-go in your model can improve the output and make it so that the interpretation of those results is easier on the modeler and quicker and more reliable uh, sort of uh, results that are able to better increase our understanding of flood risk and resiliency in our urban watersheds. And with that, uh, I am open to questions. Thank you so much, Noah. Yes, as Noah said, please go ahead and submit your questions in the Q&A feature and we'll get to as many as we can. And we've got Noah here and Dr. Gulliver is here. We also have Bernie Bullard online if you have questions about Minnesota Water Research Fund. Any questions for our presenters, just let us know. John, any comments you wanna make following Noah's presentation? Well, that, that's a, a really good presentation. Uh, it covers the ground uh, very well for the uh, the people who don't really know what uh, stormwater modeling of watersheds is. Uh, and um, uh, I think that the, the important thing is that we put these huge models together and it just takes a tremendous amount of effort to see what happens in the, on, a, on a watershed basis, what the flooding level is going to be, uh, and you're 
you have an, a, a model with 400 nodes in it, 500 nodes, and you have flooding at each node or at some of the nodes, it's just really difficult to put that together on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and so what NOAA is doing will help us a great deal in terms of analyzing our floods. Thank you, John. We've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, I'll take the first one. Have there been any efforts to map the results using LIDAR and model results? Uh, yes. So that is the sort of main impetus for this project was that we were trying to map model results and having a terribly difficult time uh, because some of the models that we had um, did not necessarily incorporate uh, the LIDAR data beyond a particular point. And we were running large storms, climate change driven storms through them, which had really large volumes and were sort of outside the range of calibration. Um, so it's not at all that the modelers did a poor job, just that we were using models for extreme storms that they weren't designed for. Um, and so those improvements needed to be made to the, the model itself before we could reliably, um, have any confidence in our flood maps, um, because we were able to generate flood maps, but they, uh, they felt unrealistic because they concentrated water. Uh, in some areas where the storage nodes might not have been defined beyond a certain height um, and resulted in those problems. The tool development is still ongoing. Um, as a result, the final sort of end products of a flood map uh, are not available because this sort of implementation in any particular watershed uh, relies on the tool being complete. Um, but as there are more updates on the, the tool, they'll be shared uh, through a variety of avenues, one of which being stormwater.saffle.umn.edu. Um, and so you can follow that along to get updates as the tool progresses. Thanks. That certainly covered another question that's popped up about when will it be available? Um, we've got another question, Noah, coming from Jeremiah. What do you see as the next most critical step in involving LIDAR data and stormwater modeling that isn't currently being used in modeling? And what would you add to SWIM? So I think the, the, the most critical thing is going to be the storage curves. Um, just in terms of the order of importance for having the understanding that at some point, uh, the water stops going up and starts going out um, horizontally and having well-defined storage curves for these large events is, is probably the single largest improvement. Um, outside of the uh, storage curves and overland flow routing portions of LIDAR, um, I, I think that it could be an improvement for implementing buildings um, inside of SWIM. If you know where particular buildings are and you have flood model outputs, you can have slightly more specific recommendations about where particular uh, flood risks are and even get into calculating economic costs um, because you have this sort of sighting of where these important businesses um, or homes are located um, because then it allows for understanding if we flood a golf course, somebody might not get their 18 in on a Sunday, but if we flood someone's home, um, that has significantly more devastating effects. Thank you. We have a question coming from Jim saying, do you have an example of validating this approach with actual storm and flood data? And if yes, how well did it work? So the main... Uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, the, the, the longer answer is that it is, again, difficult to get the large storm data um, when uh, for, for large precipitation events because they are considerably more rare and also more likely to damage um, monitoring equipment which makes the, the data from those storms harder to realize. Um, we have been working with 
one watershed up in Duluth, Miller Creed watershed, which has some aerial extent of uh, the 2012 flood that we can match um, a little bit. Um, but it's again, difficult to have that high quality data to compare uh, and validate this approach. Thank you. We've got another question coming. Uh, what do you think the cutoff is between using a fully 2D model and using a model that has LIDAR elements with a 1D base? That is a good question. Um, I am not particularly familiar with um, 1D base models, so I don't necessarily feel super qualified to answer that. John, you might have some insights on that. Uh, I'm um, I'm not sure what I what what the in individual means by one D model. Um, Swim is a multi path one D model, which can be converted into a two D model when you talk about flooding. Um, and so the one D two D explanation, um, you lose a little bit of. Um, understanding of, of what 1D and 2D are. So I'd like to ask the the person who asked the question for a little bit of elaboration. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I can't see who it is. It just says anonymous. So if you want to um, add to it, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, we certainly you can message us um, and we'd be happy to have uh, try to answer that later. Okay, I'm going to go to another question from Larry, who says, how useful is this approach for delineating stormwater catchment areas discharging to surface waters, i.e. outfalls and infiltration areas? If so, what would be its limitations? So delineation of catchment areas um, is, is particularly important. And one of the aspects of a good storage curve is delineating what water flows into one storage curve and where that ridge between different storage nodes is. Um, so part of this tool is an aspect or an aspect of this tool is to make sure that uh, the existing subcatchment delineations are appropriate. Um, and while there hasn't been any consideration about um, outfalls into surface water um, simply because that wouldn't be related to the storage node aspects. I think that a lot of the same algorithms used to detect the differences between catchments and between uh, neighboring storage nodes uh, could be applied um, in perhaps another project. Okay, going in a little different direction, uh, Jessica. It's congratulating you on an excellent presentation. I agree. And her question, from a paleo climate standpoint, I'm wondering if there's any useful information that can be provided by the geologic record to assist in flood modeling. That's a good question. Um, I am unsure. Uh, regarding uh, the, the impacts of geologic record, um, perhaps in identifying whether uh, a flood has occurred, but the, the focus of this tool is particularly on urban systems, which have drastically changed the way that stormwater interacts um, with increasing the impervious area by paving over uh, a great deal of land, as well as building storm sewers means that the water routing within a place like Minneapolis um, is, is likely much, much different um, climate aside uh, than it would have been pre-development. Um, and that's just a result of expanding infrastructure in those areas. So I'm not sure that um, there is a ton of crossover besides trying to get back to some pre-development uh, standards where perhaps there might not have been as much flooding because we didn't have as much impervious area. Can I, can I add something to that? 
Absolutely. You know, uh, one thing we do not handle very well in these models is infiltration rate. Uh, we have found that uh, in some models, infiltration rate is unrealistically, unrealistically low. Uh, and uh, infiltration is very important because it's volume reduction. You no longer have flow going downstream because it's going into the ground. And if a paleoclimate uh, standpoint or geologic uh, record can assist in the data that's out there on infiltration rate, I think that would be very helpful. Thanks, John. Go ahead, Noah. Um, for the next question, there's been a there's been a few questions about um, how the data is, is getting in, integrated with the model. So I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, like questions from Steve and Shui. Um, the end goal uh, is to have a plugin for QGIS, which is a free and open source geographic information system. Um, which is able to take in things like raw LIDAR data and produce digital elevation models. Um, in addition to uh, a lot of modeling work incorporates GIS layers uh, for sewer systems and points of interest. So the, the workflow would be a generation of um, storage curves in QGIS, which are then imported into SWIM, um, not necessarily a new version of SWIM that is able to parse uh, LiDAR data or spatial data. So it would be an output from the QGIS. Um, and part of that reasoning is that it's important to us that this sort of tool be accessible. Um, the, the point of it is to make um, the ability to have a high quality topographically based model um, more accessible for communities because it's not just large metropolitan areas that have issues with urban flooding. Um, you can have small rural communities that have highly concentrated downtowns, but maybe not the resources to um, develop their own swim model or hire out consultants to develop their own swim model. So this is designed to be something that is accessible, um, which is why we are using specifically EPA swim, though it might not be the best stormwater model out there. Um, and I know that there are some stormwater models out there that do incorporate LIDAR data natively. Um, so that's, that's the other main reasoning between um, why we're doing it in this particular way. So, I hope that answers the the questions from from Steve and Shui. Thanks, Noah. The point about making something that's accessible is really really important and is exciting to hear. Um, how about if we take Mike's question? Has the National Weather Service River Forecast Center shown any interest in your project? Could you repeat that? Or of from course. Mike Anderson? Yes. Okay. I found the question. Um, as of now, no, um, but we're still working on publicizing that this work is is ongoing. Um, and so if they are interested, if you're affiliated with them, feel free to reach out. Um, we'll make the presentation available. Uh, it has my contact info for the summary slide uh, and email. Uh, we are in contact with EPA Cincinnati, who uh, are in charge of the swim modeling and the updates on the swim model. And so um, they understand what we're doing and they support what we're doing. Noah, John, do you see any other questions in the Q&A that I missed or any other topics that you want to address for the larger group before we wrap things up today? Um. I'd like to answer Dr. Randall, Randall Barnes's question um, regarding LIDAR data, LIDAR data in highly developed areas. Um, and the, the question is how accurate is the data in places that might have a bunch of tall buildings? Um, and the, the answer to that is that it is currently somewhat accurate, but as the new, um, the new set of flyovers occur, 
we're getting more pulses per square meter. So having a, a sensor that is directly perpendicular uh, to the uh, to the ground surface means that there's going to be less interference um, from perhaps a tall building where if you have an angled um, laser pulse, you might get a reading from a building that doesn't actually exist at a particular point. Um, so those those dense areas can provide some problems, but that is one of the, the reasons that there is this new round of LIDAR data is to improve the accuracy in those areas. Thank you. And there was one question I just noticed from Jim. Does LIDAR help with land use identification? For example, turf versus an impervious. LIDAR data typically does not. Um, it, it's, it's very good at elevation, uh, and we are able to use other remote sensing technologies, typically satellite based to, uh, look at, um, the different emission spectra uh, of, of land. And there are highly developed, um, land use algorithms that can, can identify things, uh, from, from aerial photography, um, so this would be a separate tool, but um, it is another geographic information systems based technology that can be important when modeling because differentiating between turf and impervious area is important when considering how much runoff is generated. So that's another aspect of the puzzle, just not one that this particular tool will address. Thank you. And Roy, thank you for bringing your question back up to the top. One final question of the day. Roy asks, can you expand on the relevance of this method to citing GI? So um, the citing of green infrastructure practices, uh, or at least I believe that's what GI is, is referring to here, um, is important from a topographic perspective. You want water to flow into um, your rain garden in order to filter things. Um, so from that aspect, trying to identify a site specific location, um, can be done. Um, but likely site specific surveys might have a higher fidelity than LIDAR data, um, which only has a one to three meter resolution. And if you're implementing a new rain garden in a, uh, cutout uh, or, a new roadway project, you are likely to have higher quality data from that. Um, one, there, there's, there's been other work on green infrastructure siting that, that utilizes some other geographic information sciences, um, but this tool has moderate applications uh, and there are likely better options. Thank you. John, Noah, any final words of wisdom before we wrap up? Bless you. None for me. Thank you both. Noah, what a wonderful presentation. We are so proud to have you as a funded research partner of the Minnesota Water Research Fund. And thank you all for joining us today. Before we end, I'm gonna turn things over to our chair and founder, Bernie Bullard, for some final remarks. I want to thank uh, Noah and Dr. Gulliver for taking their time to share their exciting research with us. It was very interesting and I hope you, you've got a lot out of it. I want to thank you all for taking the time today to, from your busy schedules to join us. We hope this presentation will inspire you to get more connected with us at the Minnesota Water Research Fund, ensuring the quality of our water requires all of us working together. If you want to stay informed about our work and be invited to future presentations or events, join our email list. Just contact Shannon and she will set you up. It's on the screen. Share your expertise with us through part. Thought partners are always welcome. Tell us what's on your mind. What water research questions do you have? What areas of water research would you like to hear more about in future presentations? what type of water research is needed. If you have questions or ideas, reach out to me via email or message me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email's on the screen there. 
help us spread the word about exciting water research. When you receive the event recording, forward it to any of your colleagues or friends. Advancing, takes, advancing water research takes financial resources. Individuals, companies, and organizations are invited to join us as partners for 2024. We have partnership levels at $500, $1,000, and $2,500. For those of us who notify us of their partnership commitment by the end of this year, December 31st, we have a special matching opportunity available. Partnerships gifts will be matched up to the first $20,000 in gifts received this year. We still have a, a sum of that funding left. We're getting, getting closer to our goal. So please share this opportunity with your company or organization. The link to join us as a partner is shown on the screen and we hope to hear from you. Thank you for in advance for investing in our goal to ensure the University of Minnesota is a national leader in innovative water research that improves public health and protects preserves Minnesota water resources. Have a wonderful afternoon and holiday season, everyone. We'll see you next time. And thank you for being part of the presentation today. Have a good day.